22. So John chapter 3, verse 22. I'll give you a minute to get there and then we'll pray. I want to encourage all of the men to remember your mothers, but also your wives, and uh, to bless them in some way abundantly uh, next Sunday as we celebrate Mother's Day. And we'll take a break from the Gospel of John next week, and, and uh, we'll see what the Lord has to say to moms and to those of us who are blessed by them. He wants to always encourage us. This morning we're going to celebrate communion. I want to encourage you even now, um, after worship, and we've been singing to the Lord, to allow the Lord to have his way in your heart, even right now, as we keep going, and we look in his word, that you would allow him, and I would allow him to prepare our hearts. It's a very personal thing between each of us and the Lord, because as Christians, we enter into this loving, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and we remember how much he loved us by dying for us on the cross. Right now, I don't know what's going on in your life, but all is well. All is well because God came to earth and became a man to die on the cross for our sins. And he is now sitting on the throne in heaven. And he is in controlling everything and watching over every detail of your life and mine. And he's in love with us and he has all power. He wants us to be so filled with his peace and his joy. But I want to encourage you right now, difficult life right now, and uh, we go out every day and it's a battle. And even right now, let's not wait until the end of the teaching when we celebrate communion, but even right now, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And if he starts bringing things to your mind, only you're going to know it, that he wants you to give to him. Maybe there's something he wants to change in your life or mine. Maybe it's a sin we keep falling into and committing. We can respond to him even during the teaching of the word. And we can be praying and just asking him to cleanse our hearts. Just to get us ready so that when we come forward to take communion. That our hearts are ready. And uh, it's really this personal thing between us and him. Maybe you're here this morning. And you have not given your heart to Jesus Christ yet. I want to invite you this morning to listen. Because he wants to knock on the door of your heart while we're in the word. And he loves you and he died for you. And he wants a personal relationship with you. Maybe you're not walking close with him right now. But you know you know him. His arms are wide open. He, he's inviting you to come back into his arms. And just set us free. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for teaching us, Lord, and speaking to us. And that's what we ask right now, Lord. Please help me to teach your word. And Lord, we look forward to drawing close to you in our time together and especially communion at the end. And we pray, Lord, we would submit and surrender and yield to you. Even now, your touch is gentle, but it can be firm, Lord. Help us to hear unmistakably your voice through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit and let us obey and respond. So whatever you want to do, Lord, in our hearts, we're looking to you right now. Please help me, Lord, in Jesus name. And everyone said, amen. Well, we're going to finish chapter three today and we're going to be looking at John the Baptist and Jesus. And uh, so let's just go ahead and read it and then we'll. Get into the teaching. Verse 22, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John, that's John the Baptist, also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. That's the multitudes of people. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews, would have been the leaders of the Jews, about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, this is the disciples of John coming to him, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, 
that's Jesus, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. That's Jesus. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay. I got a cramp in my hip. That's why I'm going to stand. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's look at verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. After these things, what is that? Well, if you've been with us, we've been, it's referring to the events we've studied together in John chapter 2 and 3. Jesus had come into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with his brand new disciples. He cleansed the temple. We read that he did many signs, miracles. John didn't tell us what they were. John, the apostle who wrote this. But that as he did them, many people were coming to him. And then last week we looked at one man, a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night to speak privately to him. So all of that is what? After these things. And the story picks up right here. So we're told here in verse 22... That after these things, Jesus and his disciples, it says, came into the land of Judea. Okay, wait a minute. I thought they were in Jerusalem. They were. They have been. And now it says they came into the land of Judea. That's the southern region that Jerusalem is in. Well, what this means here is that they left the city of Jerusalem now, which is in Judea, and they went out into the surrounding Judean countryside of that region. But they're still down in the south. Now, if you look at the rest of verse 22, it says, and there he remained with them and baptized now when it says he remained with them there it's speaking of a considerable period of time that jesus spent with his disciples there it's probably several months and then notice while they were there they were baptizing also just like john the baptist had been baptizing and he was still doing so but now in a different place okay so let's just talk for a moment about that baptism because we know that we have a baptism once a year, we go down to the river and we get baptized, and that's Christian baptism. This baptism was, John was baptizing before Jesus came on the scene, telling them that the Messiah is coming, and it was a baptism of repentance. Come and turn from your sins. Get your heart ready because Messiah is coming, and repent of your sins. And so it was a baptism of repentance. It foreshadowed Christian baptism. And we know that Christian baptism was not instituted until after Jesus' death and resurrection. Christian baptism is a picture of Jesus' death and resurrection. Its full symbolic meaning, like when we go down to the river this summer, is the death, burial, and resurrection as in Romans 6, 5. I'll read that to you in a moment. But Jesus hadn't died and risen yet. So as they're baptizing, as John's been baptizing, and now as Jesus has his disciples baptizing, no one can fully understand yet what you and I understand now, that baptism is a picture of of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't understand that yet. But you guys, it's all one and it's not confusing. And, and so it should be considered at this point, genuine Christian baptism, what John is doing and what Jesus is doing with his disciples. The disciples of John the Baptist, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And then they were not re-baptized after that. Either when John told them, hey, go follow Jesus, there's the Lamb of God. And we know John and Andrew left to follow. They didn't get re-baptized then. 
And later, after Jesus died and rose, when the Holy Spirit came and there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> those disciples didn't get baptized again also. So, let me read you Romans chapter 6, written by Paul. He says, Or do you not know that as many of us, he's talking about right now, after Jesus died and rose, as we're baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We talked about this at Easter a little bit. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. If he died on the cross in our place, right, the day he died for our sins, and we're united with him, and his death counts for us, and it does, well, he rose from the dead, and the word of God is saying we're united then in power. We should be walking in power and newness of life. So when we go down to the river and we get baptized, probably this summer, I always come to the scripture because it's like a very key scripture about Christian baptism. So here's the idea. Have you been baptized yet? We'll be doing it soon. And it's so meaningful because it's a symbol, outward symbol to the world publicly, which we need to take a stand today in these last days. But it's an outward symbol of what's already happened in your heart. In other words, remember the thief on the cross next to Jesus died the same day that Christ did. And he looked to Jesus and he said, in faith, he gave his heart to the Lord. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, assuredly, I tell you, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He couldn't get down from the cross, couldn't get baptized, but he saved. Why? By faith alone. Baptism is just an outward symbol that the Lord wants us, that he instituted, that we do after we're saved. So here's the idea. Today, if you're not saved, you can become immersed in Jesus Christ. Baptism, by the way, we take you under the water for a moment and bring you back up. So here's the meaning. I want to give my heart to the Lord. Okay, ask him to come into your heart. Save you from your sins. He now enters in. You are immersed in him. You now have a relationship with him. So when we go down to the water this summer... We're going to take you and baptize you. And then, as Jesus said in Matthew 28, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when you go under the water, it's a picture of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and being buried. When you come up out of the water, it's for us. It's a picture of Jesus rising from the dead again and rising for you and I. And that power is now ours. And we're now raised and we have new life with him and we walk in newness of life and power. That's what baptism means. But you can see back here... At the beginning of Jesus' three-year ministry, right? And John's been baptizing before Jesus came, even came on the scene. Not everyone, in, and probably no one except Jesus himself, is understanding what we just talked about just now. Yet. And yet the Lord has John baptizing to get people's hearts and repentance. Turn from your sins. Get them ready. Jesus is coming. And so we don't really, we kind of see it all as one and flowing together, you see? And so... Um, and so let me say this right now. You go, okay, wait a minute. John's baptizing up here in Samaria in, in the middle of Israel. Jesus is down in the south. They're both baptizing. Is there a difference? Not at all. We'll see that in a minute. Because God, you know, he doesn't bring confusion. Okay, I already said this, that uh, the disciples of John the Baptist were not re-baptized once they followed Jesus. But I just want to say this, because there was a day, my wife and I, we got baptized in a pool many years ago when I was a younger Christian, and uh, I knew that Jesus had commanded in Matthew 28 to get baptized, so I obeyed him, but I really didn't understand the meaning that I just explained to you, and how meaningful that is. In other words, when we got baptized that day, I didn't understand that it was a picture of going under the water, of being buried with him and rising in his resurrection. It was so simple, but I didn't really understand that, but I was just being obedient. So years later, even here as a pastor, we had a baptism, and you know, the like I taught it to you right now, so meaningful, so meaningful. It's like I wanted to do it again. And so there was a year, a number of years ago, where when we went out there in the water to baptize, I was the first one baptized. And it's like, Lord, I, you know, hey, you know, this is so meaningful. I just want to just, man, you know, do it again. Is that okay? Totally. If you want to do that, the Lord leads you to do that. The Holy Spirit does. I encourage you to do that if it's meaningful between you and him. And again, that personal relationship between he and you. What you and I need is his love. That's what he made us for. To live forever with him in love. 
but he so has a passion that we would experience that now, here. Not when we get to heaven. Oh, then it will be in fullness and we'll see him face to face, but you guys, he wants to walk with you and I every day. That's the meaning of life, is him. Well, if you look at verse 23, it says, now John, that's John the Baptist, also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Soon after our story that we're looking at today took place, John the Baptist was arrested by Herod the king and put into prison and eventually beheaded by him. But until that happened, he kept baptizing and now Jesus is baptizing. We see that and John the Baptist's ministry overlaps the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ for a little while. So verse 23 tells us that John's also baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there, and that is up in the central part of Israel, Samaria, which is the central region. So it's kind of like you have Del Norte County, right? Think of Judea as the county in the south of Israel, Samaria in the middle, and Galilee in the north, like three regions. Jesus is in the lower region, baptizing with his disciples in Judea. John the Baptist is now in central Israel and Samaria. So, even as Jesus' ministry is now gaining great momentum, large crowds of people for a little while are still coming to John the Baptist and being baptized. Now, both John and Jesus preach the same message and both baptized, even though Jesus had his disciples do the baptizing. If you'll turn just for a moment, jump down. Don't, you probably don't need to turn. Just jump down to chapter 4. Next week's Mother's Day. The week after, we'll pick it up in 4. But let's just look at the first three verses. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. We'll see that in our story today. Though Jesus himself, notice verse 2, did not baptize but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And we'll go on with the story then. But what we want to key in on here is verse 2 where it says, Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but he had his disciples baptizing. So, I'm going to read you out of Matthew chapter 3. And it talks about back when John the Baptist, he knows he's going to go before the Messiah when God sends him to start. Right? And it says in Matthew 3, 1 and 2, In those days... John the Baptist came preaching, let's key in on that, in the wilderness of Judea, and listen to what he's saying, and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A chapter later in chapter 4, Jesus comes onto the scene, and it says from that time in Matthew 4, 17, Jesus began to preach and to say, listen, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Word for word, it says... John the Baptist came preaching. It says, then Jesus began to preach. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message, same baptism, same ministry, united as one. But we know that the Jewish leaders are envious. And when Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate, the day he's crucified, it says Pilate knew that he ha they handed him over for envy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in our teaching today. So here we are at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. They're already going to try to generate a conflict between John the Baptist and Jesus, right? They're in two separate places. Let's divide them. Let's get the people turned against them. The nation recognizes that the ministries of both men, John and Jesus, are part of one program. And the leaders could see all these people following them. We've already said they had the same message. They made the same call to repentance. They held forth the same hope of divine provision and forgiveness, and both were looking forward to the coming of Messiah. John had said, there's the Messiah, there's the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. So if you're a Jewish leader who's envious and jealous at that time, and you don't want to lose your position and your influence, you see that these two movements are, are united, and if they remain that way, they're going to sweep the whole nation. We can't have that. So we need to make an attempt to divide and break up the effectiveness of the ministry. And I put in parentheses two ministries that were really, what, one ministry. And they're going to try to divide it. 
So if you look with me in verse 25, it says, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. There arose a dispute. And they came to John and said to him, Now this is his disciples, Rabbi, teacher, he, Jesus, who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and notice what they say, and all are coming to him. That's kind of an exaggeration, huh? All are coming to him. At the point they're telling him this, there's still a good number of people coming to John to get baptized, but they're starting to see more and more, it's diminishing, are going and leaving and going to Jesus instead of John the Baptist. So, all are going to him. Now, you guys, self and you and I, right? Everything's supposed to be about Jesus. We can easily make everything in our life about us. Even Christian ministry, it's supposed to be all about him. His disciples recognized John the Baptist, that their ministry with their leader, John the Baptist, hey, it's diminishing. Because his ministry, Jesus, is greatly increasing. So they're envious. They see Jesus as a competitor. And they're resenting his success. All the people are going to him. So what we see going on right here in our story are two things. Competition and comparison. Now C.S. Lewis said this. This is really key. He said the utmost evil is pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice or every other sin. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. And you guys, it's our biggest problem. And we've said before, pride is our greatest enemy. Humility is our greatest friend. God resists the proud because grace of the humble. So we don't want to have pride because God then resists us. Oh, he loves us, but he's got to get us past that pride and get us humble. And that's our problem. C.S. Lewis says, each person's pride is in competition with everyone else's pride. My pride and your pride, everyone's pride in the world is in competition with everyone else's pride. He says, pride is essentially competitive. It is competitive by its very nature. Now listen carefully. He says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. And then he says it is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure, sinful pleasure of being above the rest even if it's in your own mind. Once the element of competition has gone, pride has gone. Pride is competitive by its very nature. That is why it goes on and on. One more thing. He says, if I'm a proud man, then as long as there is one man in the whole world more powerful or richer or cleverer than I, he is my rival and my enemy. Now we can get really sophisticated at this, right? So you see his disciples... They're full on into this. John the Baptist's disciples, they're full on into what I just read. Competition and comparison. But we can even make it sound spiritual. And we can get really sophisticated and smooth at it. When we were little kids, we were not. We were just like, you know, straight out. You're looking at it. But we get really, you know, good at disguising it. Well, in verse 25, if you look again, please, we see five words. Then there arose a dispute. Wow, I circled that. Then there arose a dispute. Question, where did the dispute that arose come from? And you already all know the answer now because of what we just read from C.S. Lewis. The answer is from you and I, from our heart. James 4.1 gives us the answer. It says, where, James says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from, he says, your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Now remember, C.S. Lewis had said, it's the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Where do the wars and fights come from among you? Don't they come from your desires for pleasure, the war in your members? I want to feel like I'm better than you, right? That's what he's talking about, and that's what's going on in our story. 
Different version of the Bible, New English Translation says this, where do the conflicts and where do the quarrels come among you from? And is it not from this your passions that battle inside of you? One more version, Holman Christian Standard Bible says, where do the wars and fights come from? But it says, don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? It's from our flesh fall in life, right? Now, in verse 25, if you look there again, please, it says the dispute, right, between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. What does this mean? Purification here probably is referring to what we're talking about today, baptism. So here's the idea. The argument is most likely whether the baptism of John was better than that of Jesus or vice versa. Who's introducing that conflict, trying to create the division? The rulers, the leaders of the Jews, trying to split it up. Hey, dispute about purification. Whose baptism is better? That's more than likely what's going on here. Which baptism has greater power? Which is of greater value in John's Disciples, John the Baptist, they get all caught up in this. So very possible the Jewish leadership is trying to make the disciples of John the Baptist jealous of Jesus and his current popularity. Look at John's answer in verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been set before him. Notice that John isn't bothered at all with this news that Jesus' ministry is growing. You guys, in fact, it has the very exact opposite effect upon him when he hears it. Instead, he has what? Great joy. What he's hearing from his disciples is exactly what he wants to hear with all of his heart, right? Even as his ministry is diminishing and winding down, he remains steadfast. He's focused on the purpose of his ministry. He finishes well, and the purpose was to always testify about Jesus. In other words, I was listening to a lot of the words we were singing in the songs this morning. It was all about our love for the Lord, more, more of you, Lord, more love or whatever. A fire, start a fire within me that I can't contain and I can't control. That's the person of the Holy Spirit within us who wants us to be in love with Jesus Christ. Let's just stop for a moment and remember, this man is on fire. This man, John the Baptist, is on fire with what a love for Jesus. Every time he hears the name Jesus, his heart leaps for joy. Every time someone leaves to go to Jesus instead of him, his heart leaps for joy. In fact, as he's baptizing, he's still telling people, go up Go down south to where he's baptizing. He's the Lamb of God. I came before him. Go to him. And when they leave, he's filled with joy. See, that's John the Baptist. He's in love with Jesus. Now, in verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. I wrote right above that, A man can lose nothing also unless it has been taken from him by heaven. And John's ministry is diminishing. It grew because of the Lord. It's diminishing because of the Lord. God's doing all of it. And he knows that. If God now chooses to change or end his ministry, John's content and filled with joy. He's not concerned that Jesus is increasing in popularity. He sees it as the fulfillment of his ministry. Now, the fallen desire of every person who's ever born, the sinful fallen desire, that pride, listen, is to make a name for themselves. When we get saved, that changes. And what God wants to do is then the Holy Spirit who comes to live in you and I, the Holy Spirit-led desire of a humble believer in Jesus Christ is not that they make a name for themselves, but that others may know and trust in his name. Amen? In the name of Jesus. We are not concerned about our reputation. We're concerned about his reputation. What do people think about my master Jesus as they watch my life? That's what we should be asking ourselves. That should be our concern. Is just getting people to look at, to him and follow him. And we're aware of how we live is going to affect his reputation, not ours. And that's what we should have a passion about. That was the passion of John's life. I wrote one verse here. It's out of Jeremiah. The Lord is speaking to a man named Baruch 
and the Lord says, asks a question. He says to Baruch, and do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. That's great, huh? The Lord would say that to us today. Charles Spurgeon said, it seems that God's way is to lower those whom he intends to raise and to strip those he intends to clothe. In other words, God will humble us. Well, look what John says in verse 29. He says, he who has the bride, and that's Jesus, and we are the bride, the church. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. But notice he says, the friend of the bridegroom, that's John the Baptist, who stands and hears him, the bridegroom Jesus rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, he says to his disciples, this joy of mine is fulfilled. I had a young man ask me one time, hey, I'm the best man at a wedding because the friend of the bridegroom is today who the best man would be at our weddings today. That's who the friend of the bridegroom is here. That's who John the Baptist is saying he is in Jesus is the bridegroom and, and everyone he's sending to Jesus is the bride, the church, right? Go get saved and follow him. You're his bride. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. But he says, I'm looking for a good verse because, you know, non-alcoholic wedding uh, reception, but I'm going to give the toast to the bride and groom and I want to read a scripture and I'm trying to think of a good scripture. And I said, you know, a really good one is John 3 because you're the best man, right? He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. That's a great verse for a best man to read at a wedding. In those days, the best man or the friend of the bridegroom, John the Baptist, oversaw many of the details of the wedding and would serve as the master of ceremonies. He was even responsible at the beginning of the wedding for bringing the bride to the bridegroom. But having done that, having brought the bride, right? His job is completed and the focus now rightfully shifts from him to the bridegroom. That's what John's doing. Hey, I am the friend of the bridegroom. I'm the best man. It's all about him. The bride is going to him. The people are going to him. Oh my gosh, my joy is fulfilled. That's what he's saying. He's trying to get his disciples to understand. Now, look at verse 30. John the Baptist. This might possibly be the most humble statement made by anyone in the scriptures. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, listen, you guys. I couldn't find it because I just read it a few, in the last few months. So I'm going, what book is it in? My office. I can't find anything as a total mess. <laughs> Books everywhere, right? But that's okay. It's in here, which is the important part. Lots of quotes on humility. Lots of people will talk about humility. This might be the best thing I've ever read because it makes it so simple. And it, and it goes like this. Humility is a man or a woman's proper attitude before God. In other words, picture you and God alone. It has nothing to do with anyone else. It has absolutely nothing to do with how a man appears before other people. Humility but everything to do with how a man appears before God. In other words, we think of humility and what do we automatically quickly go to? How everyone sees us and we want to appear humble. Get rid of that, that's not even in the room. Humility, this is great definition, is about your and my attitude when it's you and I before Jesus alone in his presence. It's our attitude and what it is is when we see how great and awesome he is, we see ourselves truly in the light, in his light. And we see how sinful we are, how great he is and how he's everything and we're nothing. And he works his humility in us, right? So then what we do is we go out like John and the Baptist. He's that kind of a man. He doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. We know that if you know his story. He just wants him to go to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And he's that kind of a man. And so he has spent time with God his whole life. He's one of the most humble men we'll ever see in scripture. And he just said, he must increase. I must decrease. So the idea is that you and I get alone with Jesus. And your life is simply all about you and Jesus. 
All about you and Jesus, me and Jesus, love for him, responding to his love for us. We are passionately on fire for Jesus Christ. We don't care what anybody thinks because we only care about him. That's always been and needs to be today Christianity. And by the way, men go on the retreat because the theme of our retreat is go against the flow. But that's secondary. You know what's primary? Follow Jesus, love him. Go in the flow with him and follow him. And as we do, then what comes is, hey, we're going against the flow. Amen. And isn't that the world we live in today? But where we're going to start off Friday night is let's follow him and go in the flow. And we will find ourselves against the flow. And so go on the retreat. We're going to meet with him. So now, get alone with the Lord. Humility has nothing to do with anybody else or what they think. It's you before the Lord really letting him have his way in you and work in you. Now, go out and live your life. And what are you going to do? You're going to live it for him. Because what you have, that consciousness alone with him in prayer and in the word... You're not going to go out and you're thinking of him all day and everything you do, you're living for him. What do you want me to do? I want to please you. I want to repent quickly of any sin. I want to portray you before everyone. It's not about my reputation. It's about yours. I want them to come to you and point to you like John the Baptist did. That's the idea. You know, we could add to this verse where John says he must increase, but I must decrease. We could add... Hold your place right there. You're in the book. Go back to chapter 1 of John when... He was telling them he's not the Messiah. And go to verse 27. And he's pointing to Jesus. And let's just look at this one verse. And John says, it is he, Jesus, who coming after me is preferred before me. Whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. Put that together. John says he must increase, but I must decrease. I'm not worthy to unloose the sandal strap. By the way... John the Baptist was one of the most humble men in the Bible, in Scripture. He was also one of the boldest. So let's not mistake what humility is. Oh, no, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. And if I'm that before you, oh, I'm, I'm humble. No, no, I'm nothing. What's that all about? That's all about what you think about me. Right? You see that? Well, wait a minute. You come, the prophets of old, and you and I come from the presence of being with Jesus himself. And all we care about is him. And it doesn't do this thing. Oh, I'm so humble. It does this thing. Thus saith the Lord. That's humility. The prophets would say, thus saith the Lord. Humility is bold. This man was completely in love and on fire with Jesus Christ. And one of the boldest men who ever lived, but one of the most humble men who ever lived. Because you lose consciousness of other people and what they think. And you're on fire for him. And that's all that matters. And that's the idea. And that's John. Now, first notice in verse 30, we see the word must twice. That speaks of a divine necessity. He must increase. I must decrease. So we can make this statement that both of these changes in your life and mine, right, must take place. Not just one of them. He must increase and I must decrease. That's what he wants to do in our life this week. So it's not this. Listen carefully. He must increase in my life, but I'll remain the same. So we're going to celebrate communion. And I already challenged you at the beginning to let him have his way with you. So often it's like, yeah, I want more of Jesus. I want more of Jesus. But I am not willing to obey him and follow him. I am not willing to die to my old self, that selfishness. I'm not willing to do that. He must increase, but I must not decrease. That's much of Christianity today. No, it only works. He must increase. I must decrease. And the order is extremely important because who comes first? He must increase. Our Lord Jesus Christ always comes first. In other words, John the Baptist is not saying this. I must decrease so he can increase. And often we'll do that. See, I've got to decrease so he can increase. Just go to him. Spend time with him. Fall in love with him. Let him increase in your life. And as you're there before him, and if you're really doing business with him and spending time with him, you will decrease. He'll do it in you. Amen? So first, he must increase. If we just do that one thing, then he is going to decrease us. Now, 
as Jesus has increased, the joy of John the Baptist increases. As John the Baptist decreases, his joy increases. So it will with you and I. If you're in life and mind, we've said it before, joy, J-O-Y. You guys, I was thinking about this yesterday a number of times, and we hear it all the time, but it really is true. And I wish I could live there all the time, and you could too, and it's possible. We just got to really walk with the Lord to do it. J is for Jesus, put him first. O is for others, put them second. Y is for you and I, put us third. You guys, that's a secret to a happy life and a joy-filled life. If we would do that, if Jesus will become first, he'll then put our eyes on others second. We'll be last and we'll never be happier. The problem is I put, you, I put me first, right? And that's the problem. I must decrease. So, what's going on? No reason for the crowds to hang around anymore. Why? John the Baptist is the herald, right? The king is coming. No reason for the crowds to hang around the herald when the king has arrived. Go to the king is what he's saying. Now, he must increase, I must decrease. A godly man, Christian publisher, now in heaven, Edwin Harvey, said this, God must, and that's why I wrote this down, because he used that same word, must. In his servants find smallness, nothingness, humility, and dependence. Where he does not detect these, he may have to reject the applicant altogether. If, however, he sees in you and I even the slightest flickering desire to be humbly used of God, the divine master maker will put the candidate, you and I, through a whittling process that he will never, you and I, will never in the hour of victory say those chest-expanding but God-dishonoring words, I did it, right? <laughs> it's him, it's him who does everything, amen? So, it's been said this, that a novice is a person, a Christian novice, is a person who is inclined to take credit to himself for what the Lord did through him. And it is for this reason that God is hindered in his trusting us with large results in ministry. But let me say this. God could trust John the Baptist with large results, right? All of Israel was going out to him before Jesus came on the scene to be baptized. He could trust him. Proven by the fact that when the crowds began to disappear, can, can I trust you, John? He rejoices. He was just after God, a man after God. Now, you and I were either living and walking this week in self-dependence or God-dependence. But the life we're living, the Christian life, is intended by God to be a supernatural miracle, lived moment by moment in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we can't, it's not difficult to live the Christian life. It's impossible. It's impossible. So it's a supernatural miracle. How do you keep loving me when I hate you? And I keep attacking you. You keep loving me. Nobody does that. Where's that power coming from? It's lived by a supernatural miracle because God himself is living within you. And it says that in Romans 5, the love of God, his agape, has been shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. C.S. Lewis also said this, pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment, or even common sense. He says, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And a biggish step too. In other words, that's a huge step. And maybe right now, if every one of us, God the Holy Spirit, would be wanting us all to take that step. And if we've taken it before, to take it in a brand new way. He says, at least nothing whatever can be done before it. Before what? You take that first step of realizing you're proud. One more sentence. He says, if you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. Charles Spurgeon, Pastor Charles Spurgeon said, there never was a saint yet that grew proud of his fine feathers, but what the Lord plucked them out by and by. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. There's this woman named Helena Garrett with her two sisters, and years ago they left a very comfortable home 
in beautiful surroundings to go to Africa where they founded a ministry called the African Evangelistic Band. And in one of their periodicals, she writes this, his people, God's people, learn to be humble and to know themselves. And God wants to teach us ourselves. As we draw nearer to God and better understand his ways, we learn to make records according to his mind. Now, you guys, this is a keeper. Listen, she says, we begin to count, and this is in your life and mine, his humiliations in, in our life, his testings, his chastenings as our most cherished spiritual experiences. We don't see as God sees often, right? She said, the saint who has the best year in God's sight. Who's, who's going to have the best year in sight of the Lord this year? The saint who has the best year in God's sight is not the one who has had an easy path or has achieved the highest success. Not the one whose praises fill the lips of men. But listen, the one who has known the deepest humblings in the presence of the highest one and who has bowed lowest at his feet. It is his hand upon us, breaking us and emptying us, that makes us fit for his use. A man in heaven now, Ellie Maxwell said, God is teaching you and I to unlearn self and learn Christ. And then he writes this sentence, who teacheth like him? <laughs> Amen. And he says, have you ever had God lay hold of you? Were you laying awake last night during the night? Have you ever had God lay a hold of you in the wee hours and reduce you? In other words, put you through something or allow you to go through something until you had nothing left to do but fling care aside and simply cling to him. I mean, he'll do that in his love, yes, because when he brings us to that point, it's nothing but him. Oh, joy. Happiness, Jesus, amen, a deeper walk with him. But we usually have to go through deep things to go deep with God. God often decides to have you and I learn in the school of circumstances. Now, let's look at verse 31, if you would please. He, Jesus, who comes from above, from heaven, is above all. He... John the Baptist and you and I, who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Now last week when we looked at Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Jesus was saying the same kind of a thing, speaking about himself. And so if you'll look at John 3 verse 13, look what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he, he's speaking about himself, who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. Don't you want to know what heaven's like? Only someone who has been to heaven can truly know what it's like. That's Jesus. He's saying, I'm the only one who possesses true knowledge of heavenly reality because I came down from heaven. When we get, it's going to be a while, but when we get to John chapter 6 and verse 62, all these disciples are following Jesus, but he starts to teach hard things and they don't like it at all. And they get upset and they're going to end up turning and walking away from him. Jesus says to them at that time, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? That's what he said to them. What if you see me ascend where I was before? The night he's arrested in John 16, he told his disciples, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And then later that same night, he's praying to his Father. And in John 17, he prays this, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So in, in verse 32, and we're starting to wind down, so hang in there with me as we get ready for communion. Look at verse 32, please. John says, And what he, Jesus, has seen and heard, that he testifies and then he says, and no one receives his testimony. Now, when he says there that no one receives his testimony, what he's saying, you guys, is that the world in general rejects Jesus and his teaching. Well, now look at verse 33, if you would. John says, he, and that's anyone, including himself, John the Baptist, you and I, he who has received his testimony, Jesus' testimony, has certified that God is true. 
So just as John the Baptist states in verse 32, the general rule, no one receives his testimony, but it's just a general rule. Now in verse 33, he gives the exception to the general rule, he who has received his testimony. So that's what's going on here. Now, in the ancient world, you know, I got my wedding ring on here. It's a simple gold band. That's all I wanted. And uh, it's extremely beyond price and value to me. <laughs> Not for sale for any price. Amen. And, uh, but people would wear rings back in, in those days. And they'd have a signet ring. In other words, your mark that represented you. You would seal things with that. They would pour maybe warm wax. You'd put your seal in it. It would harden. And so instead of licking the envelope and cutting your tongue, they would, they would close it and put some wax on and, and you know, put their seal on it, right? And that was the idea. If you set your seal to something, it was a sign of complete acceptance and approval. And often people would do that with that signet ring. Today's language, we might say, they signed off on it. Well, right here, we're in the New King James Version. In verse 33, it says, He who has received his testimony, in other words, you believe what Jesus says, has certified that God is true. It's like putting your signet ring on it. Other versions say that you've set your seal that God is true. You've set your seal to this. In the Old Testament, there's two chapters in the book of Haggai. In the last verse of the book, the Jews had come back after being captive in Babylon and God wants them to rebuild the temple and he uses three men. Haggai is the prophet, Zerubbabel is the governor, Joshua is the high priest. And God's trying to stir up the nation. He ends the book with giving a word from the Lord, right, to Zerubbabel who's the governor. I'll read it to you. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaltiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, Pastor Walter L. Wilson, who's in heaven, said that this is an unusual compliment, could probably be one of the greatest given to a man by the living God. Because what God is saying in informing Zerubbabel is that I'm going to touch your life in such a blessed way that you will leave on every other life you touch the imprint of God and the impress of heaven. Isn't that like John the Baptist? That's what he's doing. Pointing to Jesus, right? He goes on to say, Zerubbabel, his conversation with others and the manner of life would make an indelible impression upon their hearts and they would know that he was a man of God. This week, you and I are always making some impression upon everyone else. What is that impression that you and I are leaving with them? One of my favorite quotes, you guys hear it all the time, Pastor James Denny, now in heaven, you can't in preaching or whatever you and I do for him, produce at the same time the impression that you are clever and that Christ is wonderful and we think we can and we'll take his glory at his expense and we think we can do both. So which do you and I want to do? Because whatever we do for him, we can't give the, the people the impression that we're anything and portray him as wonderful. So which one do we want to do? Because we can only do one. Which one is John the Baptist doing? Christ is wonderful. Which one is Zerubbabel doing? God says, I'm gonna make you like a signet ring. Everywhere you go, you're pointing people to me. I'm gonna use you that way. You're a godly man or a godly woman. So let's look at verse 34. It says, for he, Jesus, whom God has sent, speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by measure. You and I are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament prophets were. John the Baptist here is. We're filled, led, and powered by the Holy Spirit, but we still have our sinful, fallen human natures till we get our resurrected bodies. So we're limited. But Jesus is who? Almighty God himself. He speaks the infallible word of God because he is who? He is the word of God. We saw that in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the idea is that the Father 
gives Jesus the Holy Spirit without measure. And there's no limits to the power working through Jesus. He's almighty God. Two more verses and we're finishing. Last two verses for today. Verse 35, John the Baptist says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is the last reported public statement of John the Baptist about Jesus. Notice it's an invitation. It's also a warning. But it's a simple and fitting summary of the message he was sent by God to preach. Let's look at it again. He says in verse 36, here's the invitation. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Here's the warning. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Notice at first John says, he who believes in Jesus has everlasting life. That, you guys, is a present possession that we can have right now today, as well as a future hope. But just as everlasting life is a present possession of the believer, notice, so also condemnation is the present condition of unbelievers, which are you today. The truth, you guys, isn't that, that one day God is going to condemn sinners for their disobedient belief and, belief and not believing in Jesus. They are already in a state of con condemnation. Jump back to chapter 3 last week. Go to verse 16. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have present possession, everlasting life, a loving relationship with him. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Often we stop there. Don't. Go on to verse 18. He who believes in him and Jesus is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's why John the Baptist says here in verse 36 of chapter 3, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him, means abides on him now. In other words, if I'm here today or you are here today and we have not given our heart to the Lord yet, we are already condemned and his wrath is abiding upon us. And if we leave this earth without giving our life to him and receiving his death on the cross for us, we will be separated from him forever in the lake of fire. And that is what we would deserve. But he didn't come to condemn the world. We're already condemned and his wrath is already on us. He came to save us from that. That if we would believe in him and what he did for us on the cross, he would wash away all our sins. We would enter into eternal, everlasting life now. A relationship, loving relationship with him now that will become greater when we see him face to face in heaven. So the verdict has already been given. Condemned and the wrath of God is upon everyone we know that doesn't believe yet. But the sentence has not been executed. And that's why Jesus came to save. Only saving faith in him can deliver a person from their present condition of condemnation with the wrath of God abiding upon them to have a present possession of everlasting life. Now we're going to celebrate communion. Have you given your heart to him? You know what Peter said in 2 Peter? We're in the last days, and I believe we're in the last of the last days. He said scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, hey, you guys keep saying Jesus is coming back. Hey, where is the promise of his coming? Peter says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus doesn't want anyone to be lost, everyone to be saved. Now, I'm going to say a prayer in just a minute right now because we're going to celebrate communion and we're going to take the lids off of these and there's grape juice which represents the blood of Jesus shed on the cross and there's bread or cracker that represents his body broken and Jesus is the one who said I want you to do this because I want you to remember my love for you I want you to remember I died on the cross for you because then you'll love me in return and I want to wash away all your sins every day in a brand new way if you'll just come to me. But remember how we were talking about baptism? And after you give your heart to him, 
you're already saved. And when you go under the water and come up, it's just a picture of what's already happened in your heart. This is also a symbol of what's already happened in your heart. You're going to come up and get these elements that represent what he did for us on the cross. And you're going to freely of your own free will make them part of you and take them in. And, and they're going to become one with you. It's just an outward picture of what already has happened in my heart and yours if you've given your heart to him. Lord, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. I will follow you. Forgive me of my sins. And then we come up because that's already happened. And we partake communion. So if you want to do that right now, before you come up and receive communion, you need to do that because this is for those who believe and who have done that. It's not for...